Welcome to the Eric Erickson Show podcast, Hour 3. Hello, America. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here from, I guess we can call it like Eric Erickson Studios or something. We'll have to come up with a name. In any event, so welcome to the show. I, I want to begin with something. So pull back the veil of the curtain. We continue to grow the show. And we're growing the show. We've got now stations in, in Oregon, in uh, Arizona, in Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, in Montana, Tennessee, North Carolina, a lot in the southeast, Georgia, Florida. Uh, we're now in Alabama. Uh, we've got Illinois. The, the show continues to grow, and, and it, it's been a real blessing. It's, it's been uh, a, a very hard process. It, to be able to do it kind of as an independent um, talk radio voice. Charlie and Philip uh, just uh, right hand and left hand. And, um, I, you know, I, I always say Charlie's on my right hand, but I was talking to a buddy of mine the other day who's a theologian, and he said, uh, the way you talk about him, Charlie needs to be on your left hand and Philip on the right hand because, um, you know, being of the right hand of God, it was the symbolism there is the person who was on the left hand in the Sanhedrin was the one who pronounced guilt, and the one on the right hand was the one who showed grace. Like, yeah, Charlie used to be on the left hand. He's the one who finds him guilty. <laughs> but nonetheless, I mean, the, the three of us, just as, as this this team growing, it's it's been a slow process. We continue to grow. We're now finally in an office this is the first office Philip has ever worked in, uh, literally. I mean, he started for me in a college. He worked out of his house, and now suddenly he's got an office, and I, I've got a studio with a view out the window, and it, it's been richly rewarding. It's been fun. It's been good to be able to grow this business, but I bring this up because this came up again in a conversation I had earlier today. Is I am uh, someone who does occasionally talk about faith and theology and, and weave it into politics and I try not to be preachy except on occasion but I am mindful there will come a time when I do have to be a little more careful as we get into really godless parts of the country of how do you do it how do you have conversations without being in your face and with a largely southern audience it is something I can uh, kind of ignore because we're all used to it but you get to a uh, a Seattle Washington or a um, or a Boston Massachusetts how do you engage with my worldview and still talk about these things? But you do have to do it somewhat gently uh, when you tie these things in and do it in a relatable way uh, because otherwise you really will do yourself more harm than good. And I'm more and more mindful of that because of this data. I did not have time last week to spend a lot of time on this data, but this is data we actually need to discuss because it shows, I personally think, a nation that is beginning to fray, a nation that is beginning to divide. What I mean by that is this is a, a YouGov survey on religion in America and the views on religion. The question is, do you have a favorable or unfavorable opinion of the following groups, organizations, or belief systems in the United States? And it shows Republicans and Democrats. So for Republicans... 54% of Republicans have a uh, favorable view of Christianity. For Democrats, it's 29%. And essentially, it, it percentages are on a plus or minus scale. So, for example, uh, Republicans by 27% have a negative opinion of agnostics, where Democrats by 24% have a favorable opinion of them. What I find very notable is that Republicans have a 54% favorable impression of Christianity, Democrats a 29% favorable impression of Christianity, which is tied with Buddhism of 29% favorability for the Democrats, only slightly ahead of agnostics, which is a 24% favorable rating, and atheists at a 13% favorable rating for the Democrats. So I, I, I want to actually start with the Democrats for their favorability. Christianity and Buddhism are both a 29% favorable rating for Democrats. 24% have a favorable rating of agnostics. 13% have a favorable rating for atheists. 9% have a favorable rating for Jews. 7% a favorable rating for Presbyterians. <laughs> that would be me. 8% for Hinduists. 6% for Unitarian Universalists. 
1% for Anglicans, indifference to the Church of God in Christ, a 2% favorability rating for Wiccans, 4% for Episcopalians, 3% for the Assemblies of God. Now, I find all of these things notable because what's so interesting is at the top range, Christianity, Democrats by 29% favor them, 54% Republicans do. On the bottom end, you have 55% of Republicans disliking Scientology and 51% disliking uh, of Democrats. Democrats dislike uh, Satanism 32% by 32%, the Republicans by 70%. Now, what I find striking here is when they break down denominations, Protestantism, Catholicism, they're not particularly well liked by Democrats. 12% Protestantism, 6% Catholicism. But then you have this dissent. The Democrats dislike the Amish. The Amish. They dislike Lutherans. They dislike Orthodox Judaism. They dislike the Southern Baptist Convention. They dislike the National Baptist Convention. They don't like Baptists. The National Baptist Convention, uh, predominantly black. Southern Baptist, predominantly white. They, they dislike them more than they dislike Pentecostalism, more than they dislike the Ethereum Orthodox Church, more than they dislike Methodists. In fact, Democrats have a slightly favorable impression of Methodists. They don't like the Mennonites. They don't like a, a host of Christian denominations. Presbyterians they like, but only by 7%. Republicans like by 16%. Presbyterians, of course, this is kind of a bad survey because you have the EPC, the PCUSA, the PCA, the OPC, the ARP. You got lots of Presbyterians. You got probably more Presbyterian denominations than you got Baptist denominations. So Democrats have a higher impression of atheists, agnostics, and Wiccans than they do of Southern Baptists, white Southern Baptists, black National Baptists, um, the Mennonites, Lutherans, and Orthodox Jews. They would prefer a Wiccan to an Orthodox Jew. Now, this is broad. This is national. This the regional, you would expect this to, to, to uh, not have the same impact. And this is actually, believe it or not, about religion. This is not about religion. Superficially, yes, this is about religion. Do you have a favorable or unfavorable unfavorable impression of these groups, organizations, or belief systems? Christian, Protestant, Catholic, Buddhist, Amish, agnostic, uh, Jewish, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Orthodox Jew, Atheist, Church of God and Christ, Anglican, Southern Baptist, National Baptist, Pentecostal, Eastern Orthodox, Methodist, Hindu, Universal, Unitarian, Unitarian, Universal, Mennonite, Assemblies of God, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Wiccan, Baha'i Faith, Sikh, Islam, Falun Gong, Mormon, you name it. This is not actually about them. It looks like them. It, it, It perceives to be them. But really, this is about the ongoing cloistering of Americans in communities of interest where you can have Democrats live in an area where there is superficial Christianity, but the Orthodox Jews, they're a little bit weird. And the Southern Baptists, we don't have many of those. We have people who call themselves Christian. We certainly don't have any Mormons. They're all out in Utah. So they don't know them, so they can disagree with them. Republicans continue, by and large, to be clustered around the country in more and more diverse communities. Democrats tend to be more and more cloistered in communities of their own interests. And because Democratic uh, areas of the country tend to be more liberal, they tend to not encounter Mormons as much. They tend to not encounter uh, the, um, the brain fart here, um, Orthodox Jews. They tend to not encounter Pentecostals. They tend to not encounter the Eastern Orthodox. They're more likely to encounter Episcopalians, uh, Methodists, general Protestant non-denominational types. And guess what? They tend to have a higher opinion of them as a result. This is about who you know. And the problem here is not that Democrats don't like Baptists, 
or Mormons or Jews. The problem here is that they don't know them. They know, for example, someone who identifies ethnically as Jewish, but they don't really know anyone who is of Orthodox Jewish faith. They know people who are Protestant or Catholic generally. They don't really know anyone who goes to a Southern Baptist church. They see Mormonism portrayed on television generally negatively, and they don't know any of them, so they they can be prone to hate them. This is really a survey of the closing of the democratic mind. This is a survey of how all of us live more or less in communities of self-interest, but Democrats have moved more fully and more wholly into areas of self-interest where because of that, they know people not like themselves even less. And when you know someone not very well, you know them as they're depicted on television, it becomes easier to hate them or just not like them or disagree with them. It, it becomes easy to otherize them. And when you're willing to otherize whole segments of our society, the Southern Baptist, for example, it's the largest Protestant denomination in the country. And by 17%, Democrats dislike them. When you're willing to otherize people because of their faith, because of where they live, because of who you perceive them to be, because of what you perceive their politics or their belief structure to be, as opposed to just knowing them as your neighbor, uh, getting to know them outside of that, getting to know them outside of politics, it becomes harder and harder for us to, as a nation, have community. And when you can't have community as a nation, you begin to break down as a nation. This goes back to what I was talking about earlier, the Gallup survey showing Republicans and Democrats alike both see government as the biggest problem in the country. But when you probe, the, when you pop open the hood and you probe down to see what's going on, Republicans are opposed to the government because Republicans think the government has gone off the rails and does way too much and is too burdensome. And when you look at what the Democrats think, they think the government's gone off the rails too, but it's because the government is now controlled by Republicans and might do Republican-oriented things as opposed to just not doing as much. It's really hard in a society, in an entertainment structure and all, to have people we oppose politically otherwise so it becomes easy to view them not as opponents but as enemies, as evil, as bad people that we shouldn't want to break bread with. So you see this beginning here in the survey from YouGov with religious denominations. But it's so much more than that. It's about becoming increasingly, because of where we live and who we surround ourselves with, becoming unfamiliar with half the nation. And when you're unfamiliar with half the nation, it becomes easy to hate half the nation. And when it becomes easy to hate half the nation, it becomes even easier to say, why do we even want to be in a nation with these people we hate? And that allows our real enemies, foreign and abroad, to divide us further against each other with easy tools like the Internet where the Russians did succeed, not in promoting Donald Trump, but in getting Americans to yell at each other and ignore that something wicked this way comes, and it's not your neighbor who happens to disagree with you politically. The weather outside might be frightful, but in your bed, you've got super soft bowl and branch sheets to sleep under. They'll keep you comfortable. They're just the perfect weight. Summer, winter, fall, spring, the perfect weight, and they get softer every wash. And right now, with the weather so cold outside, you want to just be snuggled up inside. They're the perfect sheets under which you and your loved one can snuggle. And right now, you can get 15% off your first set of sheets when you use promo code ERIC at BowlinBranch.com. That's BowlinBranch, B-O-L-L. Andbranch.com. The promo code is Eric, E R I C K. Bullet Branch sheets are the perfect 100% organic cotton threads that get softer every wash. Not only do they get softer every wash, but they the drape across your body is just perfect. I really enjoy mine. We've got them now on multiple beds in the house. We've just kept buying them because they're so soft. And every wash, they get softer. And right now, get 15% off your first set of sheets when you use promo code ERIC, E-R-I-C-K, at BolandBranch.com. That's BolandBranch, B-O-L-L-A-N-D, Branch.com. The promo code ERIC. Hello, America. It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number is 
7425 if you want to be on the program. Uh, where was I? Oh, oh yes. This is where I was. Have you all heard this audio? This is a, a Biden nominee for the judiciary. Let me reroute the sound here so you can hear this. Uh, I forget what nominee this is, but listen. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations uh, to all of you. Um, Judge, on the far end, uh, tell, tell me what Article 5 of the Constitution does. Article 5 is not coming to mind at the moment. Okay. How about Article 2? Neither is Article 2. Okay. Do you know what purposivism is? Um, in my 12 years as an assistant attorney general huh? and my nine years serving as a judge, I was not faced with that precise question. Um, we are the highest trial court in Washington state, so I'm frequently faced with um, issues that I'm not familiar with, and I thoroughly review the law, our research, and apply the law to the facts sure. presented to me. This is a nominee for a federal court, and she does not know what Article 5 of the Constitution is. By the way, that's the section on amending the Constitution. But she also did not know Article 2. You would think that uh, this, this, she would know this. This is actually kind of the, the bizarre one here. So you have a woman nominated for federal judge by Joe Biden, who is asked by Senator Kennedy of Louisiana what Article 2 of the Constitution is, and she has no idea. Article 2 is the executive branch. That's the presidency. It gives the president the power to nominate her. And she doesn't know it. She she doesn't she doesn't know it. And of course the left said, well, of course she knew it, but she didn't want to say. Oh, so she didn't want to have a truthful and honest hearing before the Judiciary Committee. Is that what you're saying? Really? This is a nominee for the federal court under the Constitution of the United States who was unfamiliar with two of the articles of the United States Constitution the executive branch article and how to amend the Constitution. One you would think a federal judge would want to know existed, so she's not out there trying to amend the Constitution unilaterally on her own to be reversed by the U.S. Supreme Court. How do, how do, you, how do you get away with this? But more importantly, how do members of the United States Senate look at this and say, yes, I'm going to vote for this person who does not know Article 2 of the Constitution? I'm going to vote for this person who doesn't know Article 5 of the Constitution. How do you vote for such a person like that? In good faith, you're sworn to uphold and protect and defend the Constitution of the United States, and you're going to put on the bench a judge who doesn't even know the Constitution of the United States? This is absurd. This is the position Joe Biden has put these people in. This is also, can you imagine the media and Democrat reaction if this person were a Republican who had done that. You don't have to imagine it. You know exactly what they would do, and they're giving this woman a pass. Hello there. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number is 877-973-7425. If you want to be on the phones, let's go to, oh, let's go to Steve. You know what? Welcome to the program, Steve. How are you? I'm doing good, Eric. How are you doing? Good. Hey, uh, along with all this, uh, you know, people getting killed by the cops and whatnot, uh, over the years I've wondered, you know, why, why don't the cops have some kind of a tranquilizer gun like they do when, you know, lions or tigers get out of zoos and get loose and they shoot them with the tranquilizer and they don't die? Well, I guess maybe, maybe they do sometimes. I don't know. Well, uh, you know, having talked to police about this for a number of years, and this has come up more than once, Steve, 
uh, the job of police is to stop bad guys, not to tranquilize them. Um, and if you encounter someone who is very high on certain drugs, the tranquilizer is not going to work anyway. I mean, if to work, it's going to kill them um, at that level. But their job is to stop bad guys. So they carry guns with bullets to stop bad guys. Uh, and uh, that's what they're supposed to do. Uh, using a tranquilizer to stop one, a tranquilizer dart isn't going to go as far as a bullet anyway, uh, unless you're carrying around some sort of high-powered rifle uh, that has the tranquilizer, like you're trying to shoot the lion from a distance, uh, but then that has trade-offs of cumbersomeness and things like that. So uh, the police use bullets to stop bad people. And bullets work very well at stopping bad people. Um, and we should want our police well-trained. You know, th this is just, th this gets to uh, another issue here. Um, not not to, not to Steve per se, but just the general point of, do we not want police to be well-trained? Shouldn't we want police to be well-trained? I, I would think we would want police to be well-trained, and yet people on the left want them completely defunded. This is Mehdi Hassan. Uh, he's the, the, the nutter on MSNBC. They've given a platform to him. Listen to this. The issue here is plenty of people have pointed out is not black versus white, it's blue versus the rest of us. Which is why this whole reform nonsense from Democrats is so tiring and so dishonest. You can't reform this stuff with body cameras or diversifying the police as we just saw in Memphis. That doesn't solve the problem either. Now, Democrats, of course, want to run away from talk of abolishing the police or even defunding the police. That's way too radical, way too out there. But consider this, the Memphis Police Department's response to all this controversy and camera footage on Saturday was to announce that it was disbanding the specialized police unit whose officers inflicted that brutal assault on Tyree Nichols, the so-called Scorpion Unit. Yeah, they defunded and abolished it. Okay. They defunded and abolished it. No, notice his clever sleight of hand here. Well, why, why can't we abolish the police? And, well, they've closed the unit. Where are those police officers going? And where is the money going? He sounds very clever here, and it's an aha moment for the left. Ah, they shut down this department, but they didn't cut the budget for the police department. They just moved the money to the other parts of the police department. They didn't fire the police officers who were in this program. They just moved them to the rest of the police department. Interestingly enough, uh, for those of you in, in Georgia, there's an Atlanta connection here with this police chief who was on the Atlanta police force and got hired there to be the police chief in Memphis. And um, uh, this, this program was started under her watch. I wonder if she will be held accountable by the uh, Memphis uh, police. It's just, it's, it's striking to me. Uh, to have this guy on MSNBC saying that uh, we, we need to go back to defund the police. I I don't think that's the situation. I, I don't think that's going to work well here. Meanwhile, you've got uh, this commentary on CNN. I, I forget who on CNN it is, uh, but listen to this. Well, I would first say that nobody at the New York Times has ever tried to handcuff somebody who didn't want to be handcuffed. And I would look at that tape myself a few times to see when they're giving these commands, his position is changing back and forth all the time. But the fundamental problem is they're not functioning as a team that looks like they've worked together before in a similar situation. Uh, they're not functioning as a team that has practiced, you know, an arrest and control. This was a full on failure. This is a full-on failure. This is seen as a police commentator talking about the five police officers. They weren't working as a team. They didn't do the things needed, uh, but also noting that uh, being lectured by the New York Times on proper police technique by reporters who have never uh, handcuffed anyone unwillingly is, is a bit too far, but also the failures of training, the failures of teamwork. Now, there are rumors afoot in Memphis, accurately or not, that there was some sort of personal animosity between at least one of these police officers. I, the, the rank speculation to even engage on that. What we know for certain is that these five guys didn't behave according to their training. And when you have Mehdi Hassan and people on the left saying we should just defund them altogether, shouldn't you want them better trained? Shouldn't you want the police in this country to have top-notch training? Shouldn't you want the police in this country to be able to uh, take on bad guys? You know, 
I forget what it was. I, I think I was out of college and maybe even out of law school at the time. This has been years ago in Los Angeles now. I, I remember watching this on television. There was a situation with police, and they were confronting some bank robbers. And the robbers, the police gave chase to, and the robbers had, I think it was bank robbers, they had machine guns. They were out firing the police. This was caught on, like, helicopter until they started shooting at the helicopter. But they, they had outgunned the police. They had more guns. They were better equipped. They had machine guns. They were firing at the police. They were killing police officers. They were stopping the police from, from being able to arrest. They, they eventually did get caught, but it was just a, this amazing moment of watching the, the bad guys had better firepower, better firearms than the police. They seemed to have better training as well. I remember that so vividly. And shouldn't you, as a citizen, want the police to be as trained as they can? Now, I understand there are philosophical problems for some and practical issues with police being uh, equipped with surplus military equipment. That was the case uh, before Barack Obama became president. After the situation in Ferguson, Missouri, Barack Obama began to scale back uh, that sort of training, but they still do get surplus military equipment at discounts and some people on the left are still upset about it. I just kind of think we need more training for the police. We need better training for the police. We have the guy who called on Friday who, who does de-escalation training for police departments around the country, teach them how to de-escalate situations so those situations don't get out of hand. We're not talking about having a social worker with them. This was the, the, the harebrained idea from some people on the left is that where police go, they should be accompanied by a social worker who they have to protect to make sure doesn't get shot. That's a no-brained idea as well. That, that, that's a dumb idea. Teach the police the skills. Teach the police de-escalation teach the police. Now, I personally don't think, given what we saw last week, given that video, I don't think there's any sort of de-escalation de training or any other training that would have dissuaded those police from doing what they did to Tyree Nichols. I don't, that, that was pure hatred and evil on their part. But that doesn't then mean because of those five, the whole department is bad. That doesn't mean because of those five, all police are bad. That doesn't mean that we should defund and hold the police departments. We shouldn't take the examples of these five and, and, and cast away the entire police department. You know, th there are people out there uh, on the left who say that people on the right stereotype the black community, that that uh, the police presence in the black community is different, and, oh, it's, it's, it's a stereotype in the black community and the like. That's what the left is doing to police is, is saying these five police officers are indicative of policing. We should shut the whole thing down. We should no more stereotype a community of people uh, on the right as, as they should stereotype a community of people on the left. We should treat these individuals as individuals and say together they did something bad without blanketly condemning the entirety of policing in this country and claiming it's white supremacist, claiming it's an idea derived from white supremacy, which is not historically true, and building upon the mythologies and the cosmogenies of the left in order to undermine our system of justice. That by the way, is going to throw these men in prison for life as opposed to letting them get away with it because our justice system, though flawed, tends to actually work and be good. Why should we allow these people on the left to condemn the entirety of the system for these five bad people who our system of justice supposedly inculcated with white supremacy will put in prison. And of course, their response, because you can predict it since it's by faith and you understand their faith, you can understand what they're going to say. And they will say, well, of course, the justice system will work for these five men because they're black. But wait, wasn't it white supremacy? Well, it was white supremacy. And again, you, you can't rationalize with people who have a, a religious belief about white supremacy in this country. Back to the phones, 877-973-7425. Bob, welcome to the program. Hello, Eric. Hi. This is Bob. I'm I'm sorry. I didn't hear you cut to me. No, that's um, all right. I was going to say, I enjoyed your comments, and I wanted to highlight what I think is ironic and hypocrisy. When there's a problem with the population in general, like inflation and low interest or, or low earnings, 
The Democrats throw money at the problem. Just look at the last bill they passed. Uh, but when it involves the police, we got to defund them. So for one, we got to take money away. If And if I think the GOP wanted to include budgetary to increase funding the local police forces, the left would say, oh, no, you can't do that. They're terrible. Yet they'll give all kinds of money to people on social welfare and other things and up their income. That's a good point. A very good point. Uh, th- they want to subsidize every failing institution in the country, claiming it will make it better. But when it comes to the police, their answer is to defund them, to to get rid of their money. The, the, the law enforcement may be the only, that and the military, the only two institutions in this country the left actually wants to cut money for instead of giving them more money. Great point, Bob. 877-973-7425. Again, th- this goes back to our views of the world. This goes back to our views of how we see things. And on the left, they have determined that this country is systemically riddled with racism. And because it's systemically riddled with racism and particularly white supremacy, the only way to stop it is funding, to cut the funding, to end the institutions. And Unfortunately, they're making some really bad public policy decisions in doing that. They're making some some really uh, just off-the-wall decisions about the way they see the world, about the way they process the world, about the way they want the world to function, and they make us less safe in the process by wanting to cut our military, by wanting to cut our police, by claiming they're all systems of racism and oppression, which isn't true, and yet they claim it and they say it enough that people begin to believe it. Maybe we need to cut the education institutions that indoctrinate our kids into believing that the system is racist as opposed to believing the system has flaws but is so much better than so many systems and governments all over the world. Maybe we need to defund the education institutions that teach America is bad and value and fund the ones that teach America is good. My apologies. I I do have to get back on the recipes. It's just kind of been a whirlwind uh, after the Christmas holiday season, and I got to get back there. I will start. I've been cooking. Now I got to put them down on paper and get you the recipes. Now, let me go to Mitch on the phones. Welcome to the show, Mitch. How are you? Hi, Eric. Good, sir. How about you? Great. Hey, Eric, I just wanted to uh, say I think we're going the wrong direction as a society. Uh, instead of defunding the police, we need to increase this, their funding by about 500%. Starting salary for a cop ought to be $200,000 a year. Then we could get the quality of people that we need in that position, and we wouldn't have this silliness. Look, you know, I know a lot of people say the same thing about teachers. You, you pay more, you're going to get better teachers. And I, I don't really quibble with the argument other than, Uh, how high taxes would have to be to pay the salaries for the number of police officers your average city would need to have if you if you did two hundred thousand i this is one of those things like with labor costs and and immigrants into this country for farm costs and stuff i don't know that americans are prepared to pay the tax burden they would have to pay to pay police that level um when so much of it is a, a calling for a lot of people when it comes to either teaching or law and order they they are called. Now, there, there's an argument to be made increasingly in this country. I hear it more and more often that because of the pay, because of the job, because of the stigma now involved in lots of part of the country to be a police officer, you're not necessarily getting the best people applying for the job. And I think there's merit to the argument. There are a lot of great police officers in this country, but a lot of them, the ones I talk to, the ones who call the show, they email and they're kind of burnt out to a degree, on dealing with uh, the burden of being a police officer in this country. They're tired of being the fall guy and the person, the the scapegoat for politicians. They're tired of being looked at uh, by segments of societies if they're the bad guy. They're tired of getting blasted. They want out. Some of them are retiring. Uh, And more and more police departments around the country are having a hard time filling vacancies. At some point, we are going to have to raise pay to be able to bring them in. It, it's This is going to be a burden on taxpayers too, in addition to everything else. Now, I want to pivot before I get out of here because I got to play this audio. This is from the World Health Organization. You, you would think these people 
would be so focused on COVID still or the flu or something. But no, no, I want you to listen to this. Australia and New Zealand recognise the WHO's many achievements over the past year, and we are pleased to see the focus on priority, priority areas to support countries to deliver on the SDGs. We recognise the challenges posed by the, by the pandemic in achieving WHO's triple billion goals and support the extension of the GPW 13. We reiterate the critical role of the WHO's normative work, including developing technical standards and data collection, as well as country-level support to improve health systems. We encourage the WHO to continue to prioritise this wide-ranging work, including technical guidance to address specific health issues in line with best practice appro approaches and available data. Moving forward, climate change remains the single greatest threat to the livelihood, security and well-being, uh, particularly for Pacific Island countries. We encourage WHO to support countries in building climate resilient health systems and mainstream a climate perspective in all of its work. You got that? You're listening to this, you're thinking, okay, so what? Ah, uh, goes back to climate. So I'm writing a book. And I'm writing a book about the rise of the secular religion, that it's really not brand new. It's very old things coming back. And whether it's weaving in white supremacy as an original sin, as a, as a founding in this country, making it a Garden of Eden polluted, or whether it's this idea that all things are related to climate and, and climate is the eschatological uh, worldview of the secularists that we're all going to die because of climate. And so the World, World Health Organization that should be focusing on things like COVID and the flu and measles and smallpox and chicken pox and, and polio and you name it. No, 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 no. They got to focus on climate change too because that's the thing that's going to kill us all and all things are related to climate. It is a particular trait of the secular left that they can weave together all these things into some sort of semi-coherent worldview. But you just pull back one aspect and the whole house of cards falls down. Like, for example, though we are a warming world, according to the data, the trend has actually been going down over the last decade, not actually going up further. You wouldn't know that from a lot of the hysterics out there who talk about this stuff. We're like the iceberg breaking off in Antarctica. The experts say it's not related to climate, and yet everybody in the news is like, oh my gosh, it's climate. This is a religious worldview these people have. Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day a little. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. BGW group. Void prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.